Welcome into the program. Great to be with you this morning on a Monday. And for those of you who were listening to the broadcast, the show that I do in the morning with, with Kevin Elkin's decisions, you'll know that we had a few technical difficulties went off the air. We're off the air for the entire first hour, but luckily we were able to pull through. And it looks like, at least for the moment, maybe I shouldn't say this, shouldn't jinx it, but I'll knock on wood. Hopefully, hopefully everything is going to go right for us. Everything seems to be going well. News Radio 1440, it looks like everything's going well on there. So we've got Rick and Bubba over there. We've got me over here. So welcome into the program. Thank you for being with us this morning. Right off the bat. The biggest news story, of course, right now is the government shutdown and the border. I mean, that's what just about every story you're going to see from all the major news networks are going to be. And Alabama is actually right smack dab in the middle of it. And this is really interesting because of the reasoning behind it. I don't know exactly why Doug Jones has become somebody that people are turning to. I think a lot of it has to do with they see him as sort of a representation of a, I, I guess just a Democrat from a red state because Alabama is as red as it gets. In fact, if you're looking at Trump's approval numbers, the only state that's even really in the ballpark with us is West Virginia. And so West Virginia and Alabama keep switching back and forth as to which state he has the highest approval rating in. But nonetheless, I mean, Alabama is for better or worse, definitely Trump territory. And because of that, and because Doug Jones happens to be a Democrat Senator, from our state, I think that's part of the reason that they're giving him a lot of attention, a lot of, uh, I guess, they, they're they looking at some insight from that angle. Maybe that's why they keep interviewing him about this. But Doug Jones, for some reason, seems to be in the news a lot about this. And maybe it is because they believe he's going to be a more moderate Democrat because he's from a red state. And so they're looking to somebody who might have news about a compromise. I don't really see that out of Doug Jones. Like I've said, I don't know exactly where he stands on border security at least his voting record has not given us a lot of indication on that i think i know where he stands but he's been radically to the left on just about every issue so i don't see why they would believe him to be a moderate i don't really understand why anyone would think doug jones is anything but a radical leftist when it comes to border security since he tends to be that way in just about everything else now when it comes to richard shelby he is also on the Appropriations Committee, which means that he is front and center when it comes to this. And so it makes sense that they would interview him as well. And so Richard Shelby playing a really vital role in this government shutdown and trying to get the Appropriations Committee together to be able to come up with a continuing resolution to be able to continue to fund the government and end the government shutdown. So regardless of how you're looking at it, both senators in the state of Alabama are really important to the debate right now. Senator Shelby is more prevalent in a practical way. Doug Jones really more in a symbolic way, but nonetheless, they're getting a lot of media attention and we're having both of the senators that represent our state kind of been having a big deal made about them on the national stage. So both of them went to various Sunday shows yesterday to sort of talk about what they believe is going on and their observations about the situation. And we're going to go ahead and go to Senator Shelby first. First of all, I'd like to say, how weird is it in the state of Alabama that Shelby is now the conservative senator? I mean, my entire life, Shelby was always the more moderate one, and he's somebody who used to be a Democrat. Remember, Senator Shelby was originally a Democrat when elected to the Senate, I believe, in the 80s. Uh, I believe that was would have been early 80s. So anyway, Senator Shelby, been senator for longer than I have been alive, and the same thing with Jeff Sessions. It was always, Jeff Sessions is the conservative one, Shelby's kind of a milk toast rhino figure. And now, and I think this is a sad commentary on the state of affairs in our state, now Senator Shelby is the more conservative senator <laughs> from the state of Alabama. Ooh, that stings to say, but it's the truth. And Senator Shelby goes on Fox News the other day talking to uh, talking to the anchor there and, and her asking him several questions about the situation. I did think that he had some interesting things to say, so we'll go ahead and jump straight to that. So, so what exactly do they want on the other side in order to get the government open again? 
Excellent question. We, when you negotiate with somebody, Maria, and you've done it, you've got to figure out what they want, what we want, and how do we settle and compromise and get, get something for both sides. Because ultimately, that's what's going to have to happen. You're going to have to give the Democrats something, but they, they're against everything at the moment. But they want something. We've got to figure out what it really is. And are they willing to negotiate politically in a fair way for both sides? Are you saying you don't know what they want? You've got to figure out what they want? Well, I don't think any of us know, know exactly what they want. Right now, they're just saying they're against the wall and they're against the, the numbers that we put out to the, the president needs and uh, claim they want. Um, so I haven't seen the specific things that they want. Well, what is the highest number that they are willing to uh, allocate toward the wall or toward border security? Well, that's security? a good question. We don't know that until, until we get into serious, serious negotiation. Of course, they say they're going to stay on 1.3. If they stay on 1.3 and the president stays where he is, there's not going to be any uh, compromise. There's not going to be any uh, opening the government. Uh, the people are a strange right now. We've got to get together. Senator Shelby there. And I personally have my problems with Senator Shelby. I think that's fair to say. Y'all who have been paying attention to the program for a while know that I kind of think of him as someone who's not really strong when it comes to conservative values. He's a big government Republican and he loves some Port Barrow spending. So he and I have our differences. However, when looking at this, Senator Shelby is a good resource. And I'm not saying that he's perfect on the border and he's perfect on spending. Goodness knows I don't believe that. But what I'm saying is because he's on the Appropriations Committee, because he has that inside track, and because he is somebody who has a reputation of reaching across the aisle, asking somebody like him how the negotiations are going actually makes a lot of sense. And he gives you a pretty good idea of where the Republicans are and where the Democrats are because he's one of those guys that kind of goes across the aisle. I don't like the fact that he necessarily goes across the aisle as much as he does. I wish he did it less. But because he does that, it at least means that we have a good insight as to where these negotiations are going. And if you're looking at what Senator Shelby was saying there on Fox, Democrats have yet to actually offer an amount that they would be willing to spend which is astounding to me at this level because he said that there were some that said they'd like to stick on 1.3. And as Senator Shelby asserted, he said, well, if they stick at 1.3, then nothing's going to change because the president has already said he'd veto something that didn't have, you know, at least a certain amount. And so th this isn't going to be a negotiation. And he said that they're really not negotiating at all. If you look a little bit earlier in that same interview, he talked about how he has staff members going to the White House, talking to the president, talking to his staff, seeing what would be acceptable to him, uh, something that he thinks uh, maybe could work. There have been other proposals for, I think, $2.5 billion was the latest figure I've heard. But if the Democrats are digging in their heels and saying, no, we're not going to budge, again, whether you agree or disagree with the policy – they're the ones that are not actually in negotiation at this point because the Republicans have been throwing proposals out left and right to try to keep the government open. The Democrats seem to be the ones that are digging in their heels and saying, we're not going to move. We're not going to budge. No funding for a wall. Uh, the, there was another recent proposal by the White House that the number did go up. Instead of $5 billion, it was $5.7 billion. But the thing that changed was – they said $5.7 billion for border security as a whole. So the Democrats were complaining about the wall. They don't like the wall. And he said, well, what we'll do is 5.7 for the wall and other measures, whether you're talking about drones, whether you're talking about sensors, whether you're talking about vehicles for, for border control or other technology like that. Either way, this is just for border security as a whole, and we'll try to do a more robust approach which is what the Democrats have been clamoring for ever since the beginning. And then when the 5.7 offer came in, they promptly said no. And so if you've got one side throwing offers out and you've got the other side digging in their heels and saying, we're not moving, that's not a negotiation that's going to work. At some point, somebody has to say, somebody has to meet with a different proposal 
that has not been thrown out there yet, or the circumstances have to change for them to accept a proposal that's already been made. And since the circumstances haven't changed and don't look to change anytime soon, it actually makes a lot more sense for them to try to give offers and counter offers. And right now that is not happening. Senator Shelby is saying, and again, Senator Shelby is not this staunch uh, conservative that is absolutist when it comes to the border. He's just not that guy. And so I think it's even more significant that Senator Shelby is saying the Democrats just aren't willing to work with us. We're trying, we're throwing offers out there, we're talking to the White House, we're seeing what they want, but we're coming up with ideas and the Democrats are just crossing their arms and saying, nope, not going to do it. And so this is really a problem that you have with this. Uh, apparently they've made no negotiation attempts according to him, at least not you know, coming forward with an, an actual offer. Because here's the thing, Senator Shelby, I believe is a nice guy. And I think he's genuine in his analysis here, but I think he's missing the bigger picture. And it's because he's worked with Democrats for a long time that haven't necessarily had this attitude that has developed here recently. He said, we don't know what they want. And from his perspective, he probably genuinely believes that he doesn't know what they want. But the truth is, if you've been observing them for a while now, you know what they want. You know what they want. They want to oppose Trump. That's what they want. And the reason, because in every negotiation, somebody has something that they want. And in this particular one, the Democrats have asserted that it is worth the government being shut down in order to oppose Trump and to oppose the border wall. Now, the Republicans have likewise essentially asserted it is worth the government being shut down, primarily Trump, but also some people in the House and Senate. They also have done a cost evaluation here and said it is worth the government being shut down to be able to get funding for a border wall. And so both sides believe that at this point. And so until they have another counteroffer that is making it worth their while, neither side is going to budge. But the interesting thing here is that counteroffers have been, be, have been made, but primarily by only one side of this particular equation. And so Senator Shelby is saying, well, I don't know what they want because he hasn't heard their counteroffers, but that's because they are getting what they want already. They want to be seen by their base as people that will go to the mat, that will oppose Trump, that will fight him tooth and nail on everything, even if what he's asking for is reasonable. And because of that, and because that is part of their mantra, their idea, and that is what, at their core, they're truly desiring. The reason they haven't made a counteroffer is they are already getting what they want. They don't have to make an offer to get what they want because they've already got it. And once that need is satisfied long enough, they'll probably relent. But that's the thing. If you're isolating what they want, they already have what they want, so they have no reason to come to the negotiating table. And that is the thing that I believe Senator Shelby even though he has the best of intentions here, is completely missing. He's used to more moderate Democrats that will actually come and, and give a counteroffer, and right now that's just not happening according to him. So let's look at our other senator, Senator Doug Jones, on the Democrat side who went to face the nation, or not face the nation, sorry, State of the Union with CNN. I have a hard time keeping all the shows straight, but yeah, this is uh, State of the Union with CNN. President Trump won your state of Alabama by 28 points. You're running for re-election next year. How will you explain to your constituents back home why you will not support the president's top priority here? Well, the problem is that, that the government is shut down. Uh, you know, our, our state wants the government to, to open, to be open for business. I think that's the most important thing for the people of Alabama right now. We have a lot of government <laughs> workers uh, in this state. We also have a lot of contractors who depend on that government work. You know, a lot of people want border security for sure, but they also want the government services and they want the government to operate. I do not believe that they uh, holding government workers and all those affected by government services hostage is the way to determine how best to secure our borders, which everyone wants. We do not believe that the government should be shut down and the people of this country held hostage just for a political purpose that the president has right now. Okay, so a couple things to break down this clip. First of all, uh, the, the big takeaway for me in that whole thing was 
Alabamians care more about the government being open than border security. No. <laughs> Sometimes when Senator Jones says things, when he's talking about the people of Alabama, it feels as though he doesn't actually know anybody from Alabama. <laughs> I, I tell you, and this is my personal experience, and I realize that you know I, I tend to run in circles to where I, I'm mostly around my church family and I'm mostly around my actual physical family, you know, my blood family, and uh, you know, a handful of friends outside of that, and some people here around work. I don't know of anybody that the issue of border security is more or less important to them than the government being open, and that's especially true in Alabama. I really don't know anybody that that is the case. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is someone that is of that mindset and just hasn't told me, but I'm telling you, and I'm by the way, including liberals on that. I'm including Democrats in that. And what I mean by that is they're saying that they think this fight is worth shutting the government down. In fact, the Senate Democrats are saying that they think it's worth having the government shut down because if they didn't believe that, then they wouldn't do it. If they did not believe it was worth shutting the government down over the $5 billion that Trump requested, then they would have already passed that money. And said, you know what? Government being shut down, not worth the $5 billion. You know what? You go ahead. We'll stamp it. Send it to the president's desk. Let him have his $5 billion. Doug Jones himself does not believe that the government being shut down is not worth having this argument. And so when he's talking about border security, it's like he's never met anyone from the state of Alabama. It's just absolutely astounding. And Doug Jones kind of has a habit of doing this. I, I can't remember probably the last two or three times I can remember him telling somebody what the people of Alabama want. It's been wrong every single time. I have never seen a senator that is so out of touch with the people of his own state. And this leads me to believe there are really only one of two conclusions we can draw from this about Doug Jones. One, either he is talking to people from Alabama, but only people that agree with him, only people that like him, that voted for him, and people on his staff, that kind of thing. And so because he is technically talking to people from Alabama, but it's just a very small, minute bubble that is saying this to him, then because of that, he doesn't realize that for the vast majority of the state of Alabama, people believe that border security is important enough to shut the government down. Or there's option number two. And option number two is Doug Jones knows that this is a load of crap. He's just putting it out there because he thinks it sounds good. Because he doesn't want to sound as though He's doing what he wants as opposed to what the voters want. I think that's the more likely scenario because I actually don't think Doug Jones is a stupid man. A lot of people, and I've heard my conservative brethren talk about him as though he's stupid. I don't think he's stupid. I just think that, especially in this particular case, it's not that he doesn't know that what he's saying is a load of garbage. It's that he does know, but the reason that he is saying it, the reason he is putting that narrative out there is because he doesn't want people to catch on to the fact that he knows that Alabamians on average care more about border security than the federal government being, you know, 20% closed, but he doesn't want them to know that he knows that because that would seem like him not representing the people of Alabama, which he's accused of all the time. And with good reason, he's not a very good representative of the values and the desires of the people of Alabama. And so because of that, and because he knows he seems out of step, he kind of wants to give himself a little bit of cover, a little bit of cover by putting off the facade that he doesn't really understand that the border security really isn't nearly as important to most Alabamians uh, it, or sorry, it is it is uh, having the, the government open is not nearly as important as having secure borders to the average American. And so it's almost a uh, a planned and stage acted ignorance that he's trying to put off so people don't catch on to the fact or I guess he thinks he's fooling somebody that he knows that he's just doing what he wants to do. He's not actually, he knows that he's not actually representing the people of the state of Alabama. He's just doing it because he wants to, which I honestly think it's more honest. And I would have, I would disagree with him still, obviously, but I would have almost a little monocle of respect 
for Doug Jones just saying, you know what? Losers take a walk. I get that there's people in my state that don't agree with me, but hey, they elected me. And the majority won, so you know what? If you don't like it, vote for somebody else next time. I would respect his authenticity. I would respect his frankness if he said that. If he said, look, I told you who I was during the election. If the people in my state don't like it, they can vote for somebody else. I would appreciate that. At least that's honest. What I don't like is Doug Jones playing these games and pretending like, oh, I don't, I don't realize that for the average Alabamian, they're actually with Trump on this. I mean, Trump has a very high approval rating, and this is kind of his main issue. But so he, he acts as though he doesn't really understand that and that he thinks he's voting in the interest of the state of Alabama. And that's – he said, well, that's what I'm hearing, and I really am voting for the benefit of the – no, no. You know that you're not representing the state of Alabama. And so I don't like the game. Let's listen to Doug Jones. He This interview goes on, and he says something else that I think is interesting. Well, I tell you what. Before we do that, there was one other thing that I wanted to hit on in this particular clip. Um, the whole – Holding the government hostage thing, because you'll notice he I did the time lap thing and uh, he says that twice. And what he specifically says is that it's the uh, holding the people of this nation hostage. The whole holding the nation hostage thing is just stupid. And I said that it was stupid when Republicans accused Chuck Schumer of it. You remember when the government shutdown happened with Chuck Schumer? And like I said, it always, without exception, unless you have a supermajority in the Senate, a majority in the House, and the White House, it is always at least two parties' fault when it comes to a government shutdown. Always, regardless of who instigated it. But this particular one was instigated by Chuck Schumer. You remember back last year that Chuck Schumer was one of the ones that said, we want DACA, and so even though it has nothing to do with the budget, even though this one actually does have to do with the budget and spending says, even though it has nothing to do with the budget, we're not going to pass the budget until we get something for the DACA kids. And of course they caved very quickly and basically got nothing out of it. But the point is when Chuck Schumer instigated it, I was saying this, then there were Republicans and conservative pundits that were saying Chuck Schumer is holding the country hostage. No, he's not. That's stupid. First of all, you're conflating the country, the nation, the people, whatever you know you want to say with the federal government. We're talking about maybe 20 to 25 percent of the federal government being closed. So at best, you could say that that's what's being held hostage, not the country, not the people. The average person is completely unaffected by this. And in a nation of 320 million people, this affects maybe 800,000. That's not insignificant. I'm not saying that that doesn't matter, but let's be honest about what's going on here. This isn't the president holding the country hostage, or I think in the one of the the pre previous shutdowns when Barack Obama was president, they said it's it's political arson. They're trying to burn down the country for their own. No, that's stupid. This doesn't affect the large large majority of Americans. Now, if it goes on long enough, it might, but that's a long ways off. The vast majority of Americans don't even, don't even notice that the government is shut down. Like I gave the story a few days ago, over Christmas break, I had family members that didn't even realize the government was shut down. They didn't realize it. Life goes on. And see, that's another thing that terrifies the left. It terrifies the Democrats. Because the longer this goes on, the more people think, huh, government's been shut down for a while now and I haven't noticed any difference. Maybe they're really not doing everything that we thought they were. And granted, it's just a partial shutdown, but you see what I'm saying. The longer this goes on, the more people think, maybe the federal government's really not doing all that much. Maybe I really don't need them as much as they keep telling me that I do. And so when it comes to this, the whole holding hostage thing is, is dumb. And even when Chuck Schumer was the one that kind of instigated the shutdown and he's the one that uh, said that he wasn't going to budge on the DACA thing, even when it was him that kind of started the whole thing, I still said the whole – the rhetoric about holding the country hostage, that's just stupid. So here's the thing. Can anyone explain to me who is really being harmed by the shutdown? 
Because that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a hostage situation. That somebody is being threatened with harm if they don't get what their way. Who's being threatened with harm? Anybody? Who's this really affecting? The only people that you could make a decent argument for this affecting is the 800,000 people that are being furloughed, that are not being paid, the 800,000 federal employees. And here's the thing. When Congress is reinstated, they're going to get back pay. When this shutdown ends, they're going to get back pay. Even if they didn't work. So even though, granted, it, it might be a little bit difficult now, they're going to get back pay for jobs they didn't even do. In many cases, some of them are, are working anyway and volunteering, and we appreciate that. But what I'm saying here is there's going to be an awful lot of people that basically just got a two week vacation, you know, three or four weeks. If this continues to go on, I have no idea how long it'll go on. But that's the people that we're talking about suffering. That's the people that we're holding hostage. I mean, how many people do you hold hostage that uh, after the hostage situation is over, the guys that were holding them hostage, the bank robbers or whatever it is, they're ha passing out checks on the way out the door. No, that's, that's not what's going on here. It's a dumb analogy. And another thing, too, again, I don't think that 800 people, 800 federal employees going without pay for this amount of time is completely unimportant. I don't think that should be ignored. But here's the thing to remember. They're federal employees. They knew that this was a possibility when they got the job. And this is true of people in the private sector. If you're in the private sector, you take a job, you know what you're getting into more or less. If you're a construction worker, you specialize in houses and residential areas. If the housing market crashes and nobody's building new houses, you may lose your job. You understand that is part of the risk when you go into it. If you're a radio talk show host like me, you understand the schedule can change. Something weird could happen with the ratings. You could have technical issues or the company could just no longer carry your station anymore. Those are all risk factors that you factor in when you take a job. This is true of private sector. This is true of government. If you are a federal employee, you just happen to understand that there is at least a chance that the government will stop funding your job, that they will undergo a government shutdown. That's a risk factor you do, and you know that going in when you become a federal employee. And so, yes, this fight is worth having, especially when you consider that those employees are pretty much the only people being affected. And I'm not unsympathetic to that, but you have to be aware of the fact that they understand that this is a possibility. And especially recently, you would think that if they are federal employees, that they would set aside a little bit of money because they know that this is a strong possibility with divided government. And so this is really something that we have to be aware of. Um, and finally, before we get to this next uh, Senator Jones clip, one thing that I do find funny about this whole thing is that the media is trying so hard to convince us that the shutdown is really bad and really hard. I can't tell you the number of articles I came across on Vox and Axios and a lot of the other, especially the more far left-leaning sites, but I also saw a couple from, I think, ABC News, uh, NBC. You know, usually I pick on CNN, but I don't think that I saw one from CNN. doesn't mean it wasn't there. It just means I didn't happen to come across it. But anyway, you look at a bunch of the left-leaning news sites and there's all these articles about how the shutdown affects us. And it's always they pull some obscure thing and they're saying, well, if the government shutdown goes on long enough, this is going to be something that gets cut. They're like, yeah, but that's like maybe three months away. I mean, maybe it comes to pass, but maybe it doesn't. It seems to me like you're trying to drum up fear. They're trying so hard to convince us. No, no, trust us. It's really bad. The government shutdown is really affecting your life. It's really. And everybody else is just kind of out there. The average is like, no, it doesn't seem that bad. I mean, I'm still going to work, S schools are still running, roads are still open, local government's still running, state government's still running, police officers, fire department, all that's still up and running. No, federal government being closed, not really a big deal, not really affecting me. There's some exceptions to that, like I said, maybe the 800,000 federal employees, but by and large, that's the attitude that you've got out there. 
And it's so funny that the media is like, no, no, you don't understand. It's really, really bad. The government can't be shut down. And the average citizen is just like, it's good. We're good. <laughs> the, uh, the, the fear mongering on the part of the media is just actually, I find it quite amusing. So let's go on and listen to this other clip by Senator Doug Jones. But yes or no, do you think that Democrats should give some money to the White House in negotiations when it comes to the border wall? Yes or no, some money for the wall? I think that, I think that we have to talk about border security. We haven't seen a plan to talk about border security. When I've talked to people in Alabama, they want border security. It doesn't matter what it is. And that's been well, the, it matters the to the president, problem. though. We that's the thing. Involved. We all agree on border security. Everyone agrees on border security. The question right. is, President Trump wants wall money. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer say no wall money. And I'm just trying to get an idea from you whether or not you agree that wall money should be part of any compromise. I, I, I'm not going to give wall money just to give wall money. What I'd like to see is a plan about how that money is going to be spent, where it's going to be spent. That's what we've been lacking so far in this, this shutdown for the last three weeks. We've been talking about dollars and cents and not plans. Soon as I think people see plans and see how money is going to be spent, that's what Congress is supposed to do. We're supposed to be the good stewards of the people's money, and we have not seen those plans. They may be developing over the last few days because I think the administration has recognized this is not just about dollars and cents. It's about how to secure the borders and the plans that they're going to have to do that. You know, last year, the government, uh, the administration brought us a plan for $25 billion worth of border security that I bought into. I thought it was a good plan. I passed, a, I was part of the group that had the bill for $25 billion and the administration shot it down. So we need to see the plans and then we can go from there. So a couple of things I want you to notice in there. First of all, you should pick up on this. He didn't actually answer the question. Jake Tapper asked him several times, and I think you only saw two times in that one, but it goes on a little bit before that. Jake Tapper asked him, yes or no, should there be money to fund the wall? And he never would actually answer that question. He never said yes or no. Yeah, I, th I think there should be some money for a wall. So he never would answer the question of the wall. Again, Doug Jones playing politics. So he did skirt around that one. But nonetheless, let's look at his second point. Because his overall point, I think, isn't completely lost on me. If the Trump administration really wants this funding for a wall, they do need to, a robust plan. And I want them to not only bring it to the Senate and the House, I want them to bring it to the public. I want them to bring it to the people. I think that, and I would be fine with this, President Trump going ahead and taking out a actual presidential address doesn't have to be long, maybe 10 minutes, where he has this plan and explains the plan. Explain the plan, make it to where everybody can see it, and then the Democrats look like they're the ones that are being unreasonable, if it's a good plan. And I think it would probably would be a good plan. He actually has really good people working on this, and most of his immigration policies have been pretty much spot on this entire presidency. Goodness knows I have my differences with him with some things, but on border security, he's actually been really good. And because of this, if you wound up doing that, then the Democrats have to fight the perception of, okay, well, the plan actually seems pretty reasonable and it seems pretty cost effective. And now you have to justify why it was worth all the rigmarole and shutting down the government over this point of contention. And that, I think, is a big political win for the President Trump. And so, to a degree, I actually wind up agreeing with Doug Jones, at least on that stance. I think that there does need to be a plan. However, one thing that he does kind of trip over himself with is the completion of the wall is the plan. And what Donald Trump is doing, and he has said that this was his, his proposal from the very beginning, is that the overall goal is the completion of the entire wall. He just wants in this budget $5 billion towards that. I've seen different figures, but even the super, uh, the super big estimates, in other words, the people that are, are not being conservative at all, that are trying to inflate the price as much as possible, even the ones that are trying to say that the wall will cost more than it is are usually stopping at about $30 billion. So maybe it winds up being $30 billion. Most estimates say that it's about $21.5 
Uh, he said $25 billion was the deal that was proposed earlier that he actually claims to approve. I haven't seen his voting record on that. I'm not really sure. I'm just going to take his word on it at this point. But he says that there was a plan for $25 billion that included a wall. I like the plan. I, I went through with it. Well, wouldn't you just assume that this $5.7 billion now, $5 billion originally, is just going to be money towards that same plan? Because if somebody gives me a plan and it's going to cost this much money and I look at it and they come back a couple weeks later and they say, okay, this year we want to do this much of it and we want to spend this amount on it. Well, then wouldn't you just kind of assume that the plan that they brought before, I, why would they change it? So if he's seen this $25 billion plan, why would he not assume that the $5 billion plan is just fulfilling a part of that bigger plan that he's already seen? So, while I agree with his overall point and the sentiment of his point, I think especially when he says that, well, I've already seen the $25 billion plan and I actually thought it was good. Well, then why wouldn't you just assume that the $5 billion plan is just a uh, completing part of that larger plan? That I don't really understand. That seems to be a, a failing on Doug Jones part. So here's the thing. Jones is probably more publicly open to border funding than most Democrats are just based on some of the things I've heard from him. And that's really not saying a whole lot because that's kind of like being the skinniest kid at fat camp. I mean, he's still a Democrat. He still toes the party line. And this is the problem that I have with Doug Jones. When it comes down to it, when it really matters, whether his good sense says so or not, Doug Jones toes the party line. He ran on the premise that I'm not going to be just somebody that does whatever Chuck Schumer says. I'm going to be my own person. I'm going to be independent. And he tried to make voters think, and I think that this was a smart strategy for him, even though I thought that he was lying at the time and said it. He tried to make voters think that he was going to be a blue dog Democrat that thought for himself, that didn't just go along with whatever Chuck Schumer said. But when push comes to shove, when it comes down to the wire and his vote actually counts, rest assured, he is going to toe the party line every single time. That's what Doug Jones has done the entire year he's been in office. That's his pattern of behavior. That is what always happens. That's who Doug Jones is. Chuck Schumer tells him to jump. He asks how high. And unfortunately, we have a senator from the state of Alabama that every time they need his vote and they go to it, he always does it. He is nothing but one more cog in the Democrat National Committee's machine. Now, Nancy Pelosi has for a very long time not come out and said this, and I kind of suspected that she would, but now it finally happened, I guess, because now she's Speaker of the House and she barely beat out, in my mind, I mean, I, I know from a number standpoint, she won convincingly. I'm just talking about there are aspects within the Democrat Party now that are openly socialist and much further to the left than the traditional Democrat that Nancy Pelosi tends to be, even though she's moved quite a bit to the left as well in the past few years. But this is Nancy Pelosi sort of embracing a line that has been used by the more radical aspects of her base for a while now. A wall is an immorality. It's not who we are as a nation. And this is not a wall between Mexico and the United States that the president is creating here. It's a wall between reality and his constituents, his supporters. He does not want them to know what he's doing to Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security in his budget proposal. He does not want them to know what he's doing to clean air and clean water and the rest in his Department of Interior and of uh, of EPA. He does not want them to know how he is hurting them, so he keeps the subject on the wall. He's a master of diversion. We're trying to open up government. We're giving him a mature path to do so. And so Nancy Pelosi there asserting that the wall itself is immoral. And first of all, I would like to point out the Democrats have this strange habit of attributing moral attributes to inanimate objects. Walls cannot be immoral. And they do the same thing with guns. Guns cannot be immoral. Guns cannot be moral. They cannot be good. They cannot be bad. They are inanimate objects. They have no moral qualities. Now, how a person uses them can be immoral or moral, but the object itself is not bad. If you think that the way that Trump is going to use it is immoral, 
okay, make that case. But just saying, oh, well, it's immoral. You're not giving anything to back that up. And again, I guess I expect too much because I'm somebody that has a basis in rational thought, logical thinking, debate. But when I'm looking at this and staring down this argument, there's nothing to it. She doesn't, she just makes a claim and moves on. It's not even technically an argument because she doesn't have anything to back it up. And for an argument to exist, you need evidence to back a claim. And so she's just saying, well, it's immoral. And then moving on. Well, why is it immoral? Can you make the case of why it would be immoral? Nobody ever does that. Whether it's Nancy Pelosi or the activist on the left, nobody actually tries to explain this is why the wall is immoral. This is why the wall would be bad for us, bad for them, whatever. But you have to make the case of why it would be immoral. And so far, nobody has even really attempted to do that. And her base has been saying this for weeks. In fact, if you're looking at the uh, some of the, the people in her base, I, I know that I've seen all these protesters that have said things like, uh, if your generation builds the wall, then we will tear it down. Well, again, why? You're not making the case for why the wall is immoral. And another thing, too, are you, are you going to tear down the walls that are already there? And this is really, if you're taking this to its logical conclusion, this is the problem with Nancy Pelosi's argument as well. Because if she's saying the wall itself is immoral, the border wall itself is immoral, then let's apply that logic to other situations and see if it pans out. This is a, a good thought exercise for those of you that are learning logical thinking, rational thinking, to be able to apply a concept to a different situation and see if it still bears out. So... Were the walls immoral when Democrats voted for 700 miles of them in 2006? Because that's exactly what happened. You had Democrats all over the place passing this by an overwhelming majority in 2006. There were about 700 walls in the Secure Fence Act of 2006, and the Democrats voted in favor of it. Now, granted, Nancy Pelosi didn't, but an awful lot of the members of the House did. In fact, if you're looking at it, and if you're looking in the Senate, for example, you had Chuck Schumer, Hillary Clinton, Dianne Feinstein, Barbara Boxer, Bill Nelson, President Obama himself. 26 Democrat senators said, yeah, border wall, good idea. It included other things too, but they saw the proposal, saw that it had 700 miles worth of border wall, and they're like, yep, we're going to go with it. Was it immoral then? Because if that's the case, Nancy... You need to call out Chuck Schumer. You need to call out Barack Obama. You need to call out all the other Democrat senators that voted for the wall and tell them that they were immoral too. Because if you're taking your argument to this logical conclusion, then you have to say it was immoral then, it's immoral now. And you have to say the same thing to the members of the House that are still part of the Democrat Party. There were, I believe, 20, or sorry, 64 Democrats in the House that actually voted in favor of the Secure Fence Act in 2006. And so if it's immoral now, why was it not immoral then? Are you saying that all the Democrats that voted in favor of it did so in error and that they were immoral for doing so? Not a policy difference because that's – you can have a policy difference and it not have a moral component to it. But you're saying it was actually immoral. And if that's the case, you need to go out and rebuke your fellow Democrats that voted for it in 2006. Here's the other question. Are border walls immoral? Because if the border wall itself is immoral, if it would be immoral for America to do it, wouldn't it be immoral for other countries to do it? You would think so. It would make no sense for it to only be immoral when America does it, even though that seems to be the standard by the left. Because if that's the case, there's a lot of immoral countries out there. For example, at the end of World War II, seven nations had border walls. Seven. As of 1989, keep in mind, this is the year that I was born, 29 years ago, there were 15. So they had barely doubled by the time I was born. Now, in the 29 years since I've been alive, since I've been walking on this earth, 77 nations have built border walls. That means that 62 nations have built border walls in my lifetime. Why aren't you calling out those countries? 
why aren't you talking to the people at the UN and saying, this is immoral what you're doing. This is wrong that these other countries are building these border walls. It seems like it only is a problem and it's only immoral because it hurts her political party. It keeps potential Democrat voters out of the country that it hurts her with her base. It seems that she only thinks it's immoral because it may negatively affect her. And so that's why she tends to take a stand against it. And if you're thinking, oh, well, these are probably a bunch of third world nations that are just building these border fences that are at war. Now, some of the fences were built because countries were at war. But if we're talking about the countries that built the fences, it's usually ones that had the power, the influence, the economy, and the infrastructure to be able to do so. For example, if we're looking at you know the Asia Minor, Asia, Asia Minor, Africa, Middle East. Let's look at some of those countries. Okay, Austria, Bulgaria, Greece, Hungary, Macedonia, Sol, uh, Solnovia, Ireland, Israel, Cyprus, India, Turkey, Serbia, Croatia. I could go on. What do you notice about a lot of these countries? A lot of them are first world countries in Europe. And so if it's immoral to build a border wall, why doesn't she come out against any of these countries? And by the way, in a lot of these countries, it turns out the physical barrier, the wall, the fence, whatever you want to call it, it actually works pretty darn well. So let's look at, uh, a court, this is according, by the way, to Elizabeth Vallette, who is a professor of geography at the University of Quebec. And she's, um, you know, quoting all of these and, and talking about all the different countries that are putting this up. And she would know that this is a study she did. She specializes in this stuff, the countries that have border walls. And I don't know if she's conservative or liberal or whatever. She's cited in a, uh, a USA Today article, and it doesn't seem like she's a conservative based on some of the things that she's saying. She's just telling you the facts that these are the nations that built a border wall. And so let's look at some of the effectiveness of it. Israel, since building their border wall on the West Bank, their terrorism has decreased by over 90%. 90%. They had been trying to negotiate peace, negotiate to stop these terrorist attacks for decades. But it was only when they built a wall that they started to see results. So negotiations failed them. Building an actual physical structure didn't. And they had far less trouble with illegal crossings and 90% decrease in terrorism. Sorry, but the wall works. Let's look at some other countries. India built a 1800 mile wall on the Bangladesh border and that drastically cut crime in the region. So they were having all kinds of trouble with illegal crossings, crime across the Bangladesh border. They built this wall, which by the way, again, built it in my lifetime, 1800 miles long and they were able to pull it off and it drastically cut their rate. I don't think that the full 1800 miles has been completed. I think this one started in about 1992, but the vast majority of it has been, and it has been a really, really big help to them when it comes to their crime rate. The EU for the, all the EU's posturing about how it's evil that America wants to build a wall on the Southern border. The EU actually um, has built these walls in Europe. They've actually built border walls and funded them. For example, in Cyprus, they funded one, and even though they didn't fund this uh, either of these, they were perfectly fine with Greece, Turkey, and Turkey, Syria. So when you're talking about the border between Greece and Turkey and then the border between Turkey and Syria, these are both brand new border walls, again, erected in my lifetime, and the EU was perfectly fine with it. The UN was perfectly fine with it. Nobody complained when Greece and Turkey decided that they needed a border wall to separate their countries. Nobody complained about it. And turns out it actually works pretty well. Part of the reason that the EU wanted this wall up there is because they wanted to make sure that there was a barrier that would keep a lot of illegal migrants, a lot of people from the, you know, the, the aftermath of the Syrian civil war from crossing over into the EU where they would be able to easily go between countries within the European Union. And so this was a wall that not only did the EU seem fine with, but it seemed like they actually approved of because it was going to help them better manage who was in their countries. And 
on that standpoint, I really don't blame them. Let's also look at uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia built a barrier that spanned about 600 miles. Now, granted, it wasn't all physical wall. Some of it was uh, ditches and trenches that were manned by soldiers. Some of it was minefields. But they built a barrier on their border. And that's the reason that they were one of the only countries that held back ISIS. ISIS was wrecking havoc in that region, and Saudi Arabia was next on the list. And you know what stopped it? Border wall, border control. They put all this up in a matter of, I guess it would have been about uh, just weeks. And when they saw ISIS coming, they had this barrier up, ready to go. That's the reason that Saudi Arabia did not have much trouble with ISIS. The wall worked for them. So we're just seeing example after example after example after example. The article that I was looking up a lot of this information on, they had about two or three dozen examples of this. I won't go through all of them. But time after time, the walls, an actual physical barrier, does have value. It does work. And so is it immoral to have a wall around your house? Because there are a lot of people that it's not because they're you know, evil. It's because they hate the people outside. They have walls around their house. They have the wall with the walls of their house. And they also have a secondary wall around their house. There's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people example uh, with a pool to keep people out of their pool. They'll have a fence around there. Nothing wrong with that. It's not because you hate other people. It's not because you don't like them, but you know, there's certain things inside that you have access to and you don't want other people to have access to ergo a wall. There's absolutely nothing immoral about that. And this is my question to Nancy Pelosi, who's saying that the wall is immoral. How many illegal immigrants is she willing to take in? This is a woman who has several houses in D.C. and in California. And she is the, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the sixth wealthiest person, the sixth wealthiest politician, rather, in the state of California. Very wealthy person. Makes a lot of money off of her wine vineyards. Has several very large houses that could house no telling how many Mexican families, no telling how many South American families. So when is Nancy Pelosi going to pony up and say, you know what? I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And I think these people should be allowed to come over here to make a better life for themselves and I'll house them. Why is it that nobody ever asked that question of her? All right. Well, uh, and, and sorry, finally, is it immoral to have walls around the Vatican? Because the Vatican, the smallest country in the world, has border walls all along its border. I mean, the whole thing. And let's also keep in mind, Nancy Pelosi is a Catholic. So if she's going to say that the wall is immoral, she not only has to rebuke her fellow Democrats, she not only has to rebuke other countries around the world, she not only has to rebuke people with walls around their houses, she also has to rebuke the center of her own religion. So how does she assert that a border wall is inherently immoral when her religion, which you would assume is where her morality comes from, the source of her moral teachings has a giant wall around the country that they control. It makes absolutely no sense. All right. So let's go to the phones before we go to another break. Uh, let's go to line one. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, what's on your mind this morning? Just wanted to say, you know, all of the federal buildings in Washington, D.C., why don't they knock down the walls at the Capitol so anybody can go in there when they get good and ready to? Yeah, why not? They're public Those property. There's out front, that, and they have people with machine guns on top of it so you can't get in there at the White House. Mm -hmm. Places like that. All the federal buildings, they have walls. Yeah. They're not? I mean, just about all of them. I'm sure you could find a few that don't, but especially if you're talking about congressional office buildings, they have barriers and security. They have armed guards all over the place. seems to me like the wall works for them. Yeah. Uh, see, Nancy Pelosi and many others are hypocrites because they have walls around their offices of security people with guns that protect them all the time. Try to get in to see one of them. You'll see what it's like. Oh, I know. I've, I've been down to the Senate know, building. Yeah. I've been to the House. I know what it's like. And it's it's ridiculous because walls have been in place since the beginning of civilization. Absolutely. They've walled their cities. Uh, you can look at the Bible times and mm -hmm. 
That's one of the things that's in the Levitical law is about walled cities and how you're supposed to handle that and, and people that come in from other places. So if it's immoral, then you've got a lot of immoral progressives in all of her houses and yep. why didn't she let people come in and out of her house when she get, they get good and ready to? Well, see, that's the thing. I'm pretty sure that if I just happen to be in D.C. and need a place to crash, that I can't just walk into Nancy Pelosi's house and take a nap. Probably she lives in a gated community because I would imagine in her situation, See, that should be a, a research project that's done by someone because I'd like to know how many progressives live in gated communities. That's very difficult to determine, and I, I totally get what you're saying. That's really difficult to determine, though, because as a general rule, they don't want people to know where they live. And so it's hard to find pictures of their houses or find out if there's actual walls around their houses, which you think about that. Why wouldn't they want people to know where they live? Because they yeah. don't want random people they don't know showing up to their house, and I don't blame them. But if they're going to say that, why is it okay with them to just let whoever wants to cross the border cross the border? Instead of having uh, Walmarts, we could have open-air markets if they don't need walls. Yeah, why not? Just walk in, it's grab something, thing. walk back to your truck. That falls on its face. They make it into a racist issue, and it's just ridiculous because they left places with walls around their homes, too, <laughs> if they had somewhere to live. So yeah, that's the thing. That, there's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but no, don't, t don't tell me we need to leave the country wide open and undefended when you're going to an office every single day that has armed security and walls around it. And she has a driver for her car that picks her up and takes her to Congress, too. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me, especially now that she's Speaker of the House. She has that big corner office now, I'm sure. Yeah. But anyway, I just wanted to bring those things up, and you're right earlier. Uh, Nancy does it. She's worth over $40 million, according to the Internet. Sure. Uh, and she has six homes, and as a result of that, she could take in quite a number of these people. If she were willing to adopt them, uh, then I would say, Nancy, you got a point about the wall. You know what? If, if she did that, I would say, Nancy, still disagree with your position. But you're not a hypocrite. You no. you practice what you preach, and I respect that. Absolutely. But she's not going to do that. No. Take care. Thank you. I appreciate it. So uh, thank you so much, John, from Millbrook. Now, what this really boils down to is this is just a desperate play for somebody that cannot explain why the wall is a bad idea. That's all it is. They can't explain why they don't want the wall. There's no logical, rational thinking person that can explain to you why they do not want a wall in place. And because of that, they resort to the only thing they've got left, which is screaming, well, it's immoral. Because they don't know how to explain it to you in a logical way. So they do an appeal, a moral appeal to your emotions because it's all they've got in their pocket. So let's look at some of the practical arguments for a wall. A wall is important because it's part of a security plan. Now, I don't, I'm not asserting, and I don't know of anybody on the right, including Donald Trump, that is asserting that a wall by itself is enough. In fact, the executive order that Donald Trump signed included electronics, surveillance, drones, uh, an increase in agents on the border, an increase in their presence. And so Donald Trump does not... He, Donald Trump does not believe that a wall itself fixes all the problems. And any politician that offers any solution that's a silver bullet to any issue, I'm automatically skeptical of. But Trump hasn't done that. Now, I think he overstates the importance of the wall, and I think that that's probably a fair assessment. But if we're talking about the fact that a wall is just not necessary, it won't do anything to solve the problem, it's not going to help. Whenever someone presents you with that argument, here's a great way to counter it. Say, if you were a person trying to sneak into the country, whether it was for good intentions or evil intentions, regardless of what it is, where would you try to sneak in? A place that has a wall or a place that does not have a wall? And they'll, if they're honest, they'll always answer, well, I'd rather go across a place that doesn't have a wall. Exactly. Which means that it bottlenecks the population. There are people that try to get over the wall, sure. There are people that break through the wall. There are people that tunnel under the wall. There are people that go over the wall. Sometimes the wall fails. It's not fail-proof. I understand that. And yet, 
typically speaking, when people do try to cross the border, they do so at a place where there is not a wall. Why? Because it is an impediment. And it's a very obvious impediment. And because of that, they try to find an area that they can skip across that doesn't have a wall impeding them from making that journey. That's why we've seen a drastic decrease in areas that actually have a physical wall. And this makes sense to anybody that has a logical thinking brain in their mind. Let's think about it like a door to your house, because that's a physical barrier and impediment from people that want to come in. If you're going to make the argument, well, walls don't work. You can climb over them. You can go under them. You can break through them. The wall doesn't work. Okay, well, doors can fail too. People can pick your lock. People can bust the door down. People can kick it in. The point is a wall or a door is not foolproof. Sometimes you could accidentally leave it unlocked, for example. So a door is not a foolproof security measure. But you'd be an idiot to not have one because at the very least it slows the guy down. At the very least, you hear somebody busting on your door and you're able to alert yourself and head downstairs with your gun or however you handle it. And so at the very least, it stalls them a little bit. And it's the same thing with illegal immigration. I know that people can climb over the fence, but let's look at some of the video that we saw back when, if you remember that I showed it on this, it's, uh, this show as well. If you remember going back to the migrant caravan, when it got to the Southern border of California, there were people that climbed up to the top of that fence. I get that people can climb fences, but you know what happened? Border patrol showed up and they climbed back over the fence because they didn't want to have to deal with border control. Well, if they just skipped across the fence, in other words, there was no fence there to climb, they would have been inside the country for a while. They might have even gotten away and been able to storm through. And so the fact that they were at an area with a border fence probably helped keep a lot of those illegal immigrants out. Because at the very least, it is a roadblock that they have to surmount. And it's the same thing with the door. If I had to pick between a house with a armed security guard 24 hours a day and an electronic security system and no door and a house with a door and none of those things, honestly, I probably pick the 24 hour security guard and the electronic security system. However, why would you not opt to have a door? Because the door would make the electronic security system and the security guard more effective than they would be without it. Because if the security guard is alerted to what's going on when he hears somebody trying to break in, then he has time to prepare himself. And the electronic security system can be wired to where when the door opens, a sound goes off. Or alerts you or alerts police or alerts somebody. But the point is, those are all part of a security plan. They work together and the more security you have, the more different parts of those plans that you have that work in conjunction, the more secure you are. And so just because the wall is not perfect and not a silver bullet does not mean it's not useful. And so these are some of the arguments that you can really use to kind of break down this whole thing. And I say this as somebody who's worked security before. I've been a security guard for several different companies. And uh, probably the longest was with a hotel but I've actually worked freelance security before. And I can tell you that, granted, working security is never an easy job no matter where you are. But you are way better off doing it for live events if it happens to be inside a bar or inside some kind of physical location with walls and doors than you are just out in the open. It's really hard to control the crowd when you're doing an open door venue. I mean, it's, it's just not easy because there's all this open space. And if somebody wants to get away from you, usually they can. I mean, even if you're in really good shape and really good at your job, it's really difficult to control everybody at an outdoor venue. That's why even when they go to an outdoor venue, they put up barriers. They put up fences so that they can control the crowd and make sure the people that are supposed to be there are supposed to be there and the ones that aren't don't. And so I say this to somebody that's actually worked security. You would much rather work at a place that has a physical barrier surrounding it so you can bottleneck the crowds in and out to make sure only the people there are the ones that are supposed to be there. And so you will have the ability to kick people out and keep them out if they need to be kept out. 
So if you're looking at the statistics, areas that actually have walls like El Paso, Tucson, and the Yuma dist- or the Yuma area down in Arizona see a drastic reduction in attempted crossings and criminal activity. So you don't just have a decrease in crossings, you also have a decrease in attempted crossings. In other words, exactly what I was saying. People, if they're trying to figure out how to get across the border, they tend to go to places that don't have walls, which means that we can now secure those areas better because we can divert resources to them instead of having to be spread out over the entire border. And so this is something that makes it easier for everybody involved to keep illegal immigrants out. And these cities that are near these border walls have seen a decrease in criminal activity. Apprehensions today are roughly one-tenth of what they were after the 2008 expansions to the border wall in the Yuma district. And in that particular area, they used to get about 800 apprehensions a day, according to Border Patrol. Now it's less than 50. So they cut it significantly with the addition of a border wall. They also catch about 92% of the attempted crossings, according to their estimations. And so they never know exactly how many attempted crossings there are because sometimes one slips past you and nobody even knows that they were there. But based on their estimations and the math that they've been able to do, they apprehend 92% of the people that come across. That's a very high success rate, especially compared to an area that doesn't have a border, where it's hard to even guess how many people got past them. And another thing, too, is that it's also somewhat symbolic. That it's a sign to the rest of the world, it's like, look, if you want to come into America, that's great, we have a process for you, but don't come in illegally. When Obama was rolling out the red carpet, promising illegals all these things, and even running ads for American food stamps in Mexico City, and yes, that really happened. When that was going on, you saw a drastic increase in attempted crossings. Since Donald Trump has been elected, you know that he's actually deported less people than Barack Obama? Not because his policies are more lenient. In fact, they're actually a lot stricter. The reason that he's deported less people is because less people have attempted to come over to this country. Just by Trump's rhetoric alone, just by saying to other people without actually changing the plan at all, just by saying to the rest of the world, we have borders, we're going to secure them, don't come to this country unless you plan to do so through a legal process like asylum seeking or talking to an embassy and trying to apply for a green card. Just the change in rhetoric by itself has resulted in a drastic drop in attempted crossings. And so the border wall going up is symbolic saying, yes, border security is important to us. Do not break our laws. And so that's another aspect of it that I don't think people usually consider. So there's a lot of practical reasons why the border wall is a good idea. And people that oppose the border wall typically are doing so based on feelings, not facts. Because if you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at the statistics, and you're asking the people that actually are there on the border and work the border every day, they're telling you, yeah, the wall works. It's as simple as that. All right, so since it's uh, we're getting pretty close to uh, the end here, we're going to go ahead and go to the Daily Dose of stupid. Now you messed it up. (laughs) You're stupid. So today's daily dose of stupid, um, actually today's daily dose of stupid is twofold. So there are two people that are the subject of today's daily dose of stupid. And to really set the stage here, I think you need a little bit of background. So the media is just absolutely ecstatic at some of the new minorities in the house and some of the headlines have read, for example, the most religiously diverse house of representatives there's ever been, which could have just as easily said the least Christian house of representatives that there's ever been. And that's really what the media is excited about, which by the way, kind of goes against some of the things that Adams and Jefferson believed in because they believed in freedom of the religion. But they also said that from a personal standpoint, even though the American people can elect whom they want, they think that Christians really should be the ones that are in leadership positions, and and Adams and Jefferson both asserted this. But anyway, the reason that I bring that up is because there is a the first Muslim woman that has ever been elected to the House of Representatives 
was sworn in, Rashida Talib, and there w- there's a lot of problems with her just besides what we're about to talk about because she is wildly anti-Semitic. The very first day in office, she spent with Linda Sarsour and Amir Zahir, which Sarsour has close ties to Louis Farrakhan, a well-known anti-Semitic and or a well-known anti-Semite, and also once claimed that it was an honor and a privilege to share a stage with the terrorist Rasamid O'Day, who was personally involved in the killing of Jews and a sympathizer with Hezbollah. So just really horrible people, really, really terrible. And these are people that she has seen fit to associate with. By the way, the map in her new office also has a post-it note with the word Palestine on it pointing at Israel. So basically asserting that the Israel state should not exist. This woman is a real piece of work, especially when it comes to her hatred of the Jews. But anyway, um, the other day she had, this was an event that was hosted by moveon.org. And she had this to say about the president. And when your son looks at you and says, Mama, look, you won, bullies don't win. And I said, baby, they don't. Because we're going to go in there, we're going to impeach the mother... So you can hear their wild applause. Everybody's excited because she used the F-bomb to describe the president. Look, this is beyond the pale, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on. There are even Democrats that saw that and said... That's that's too far. That's not helpful. You don't say that about the president, even as much as we disagree with him. And that's exactly the right attitude to have. I've never used language like that to describe Barack Obama, President Clinton. I mean, there is a certain amount of respect for them as human beings, first of all, because I wouldn't use that term to describe a human being. But I also wouldn't use that term to describe a president. You have more respect for the office than that. It's not helpful. It doesn't get your point across. All it does is, I guess, make her feel better. But let's break this down a little bit. Um, First of all, it's not even technically correct. Because Trump, if you're asserting that he's the one that was the bully, and I assume that you are since he's the one you're talking about impeaching, well, he did win. He won the election. You may not like it. You may not agree with it. You may not understand how it happened. But yeah, he actually did win. And so when you say bullies don't win and assert that Trump is a bully, well, he did win. He already won. And so it's a re- it's technically not correct. But on top of that, to me, the most disturbing part of this whole thing is that she said this to her son, who even her oldest son, and I don't know which one she was talking to, but even her oldest son is f- maybe 14 at the oldest. I couldn't really find his age. I tried to do some research on it. I found his name, but I couldn't find his age. But just based on the pictures, and I'm going off of this just based on kind of eyeballing it, he's certainly not an adult. He's maybe 12, 14-ish, somewhere in that area, maybe even younger. I'm not really sure. But that, to me, is the thing that bothers me the most. Because as much as it is disgraceful and distasteful, To me, the biggest travesty here is that's how she's raising her child. And another thing that is a little ironic about it, I thought that there was the whole thing about Muslims not swearing. Like, isn't that actually part of the Quran? I know that they're, even though I have some pretty deep-seated disagreements with them, the Nation of Islam, for example, they are pretty strict about not swearing. And so... I believe that's actually in violation of her religion to say something like that about anybody, to use that kind of language for any reason. But it really does make me sad that she's raising her son that way, and that just uh, really is terrible. Because I look back, for example, with my parents, and my parents never referred to Barack Obama, Bill Clinton that way. And those are the only presidents that I can remember because they were the only ones I was alive for. Uh, I was born in the uh, the George H.W. Bush era. But I can never remember at any time in my lifetime, my parents even com- coming close to using language like that to describe a president of the United States. 
and even though they disagreed with them and talked to me about that because they were, you know, politically kind of to the right too, they never got that heated about it that they felt comfortable using foul language to describe them. You can disagree with a person's beliefs. You can disagree with their policies without attacking the person themselves. And that seems to be something that we have completely lost in this country. And this thing was so reprehensible that it even drove away several Democrats, including Doug Jones. And I'll give Doug Jones credit on that. He actually called her out for saying that and said that it, it didn't help her and it wasn't something that he would approve of. But unfortunately, there are some stupider Democrats that happen to go to the mat and actually defend her. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the golden standard for stupid nowadays, said Republican hypocrisy at its finest. Saying that Trump admitting to sexual assault on tape is just locker room talk, but scandalizing themselves into faux outrage when my sis says a cuss word in a bar. GOP lost entitlement to policing women's behavior long ago. Next. All right, so there's a couple problems with this. But I would like to start out by saying this. On its surface, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has a little bit of a point. But she's kind of like that kid... And we all knew that kid when we were little that they were trying really hard to impress others. And because they were trying really hard to impress other people, they would do all kinds of crazy, stupid things and they would start out. Okay. Like it would start out actually kind of cool, but they pretty much always <laughs> face planted like right into a brick wall. That kind of feels like what a Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is. She's that kid that will take any dare or, you know, build this gigantic ramp for their bike and then wind up really hurting themselves when they try to do something cool with it. It's like they start out okay and then, whoa, nope, 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 face first in the mud. And that tends to be sort of a pattern with her. So she starts out with a decent point, which is the people that just brushed Trump's locker room talk about that, saying that he'll grab him by the you-know-what that just said, ah, you can't take that seriously. That doesn't matter. That's just, you know, guys being guys and him saying it in a private setting. No, that was wrong. And people that tried to make excuses for it and said that it wasn't wrong, those people were wrong for doing that. And there is a certain group of that people, in fact, I would guess probably most of the people that tried to excuse Trump on that, that are really upset about this. And you know what? Those people absolutely are hypocrites. You're right, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I agree with you on that. However, here's the funny part about it. She's saying that Trump was wrong for doing that, and that these people that said what Trump did was wrong, but or, or sorry, what Trump did was fine, but her saying this was a problem are hypocrites. She's right on that too. But then she goes and defends this woman for saying this. Which means that by her own definition that she just presented, she is a hypocrite because she's excusing what this woman said and saying, well, what Trump said was beyond the prale. Okay, then by the definition that you just gave, that means that you too are a hypocrite. And this is something that you need to be cautious about whenever you accuse somebody of being a hypocrite. See if you can flip it back on yourself and if it still works. Because if it does, then that means you're also, by calling them a hypocrite, admitting to being a hypocrite yourself. And so Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez basically throws out what is a decent point and then gets about halfway through the tweet and then just slams smack into a brick wall <laughs> and refers to herself as a hypocrite by her own logic. And here's another thing that I do want to point out. There were Republicans that did condemn that at the time. There were quite a few Republicans, including uh, even Martha Roby, who I thought it was really disingenuous and she was doing it for political gainsmanship. But the point is, there were Republicans that did come out and condemn it. And so it's not as though the entire GOP came out and said, yeah, it's just locker room talk, talk don't worry about it, it's fine. No, there were a lot of especially conservatives that came out and said, yeah, that's, that's reprehensible. That's horrible. You don't, you don't say that about women. And there were several people like me that didn't vote for him, that that was part of the consideration, the way that he treated women, even before that clip came out. 
But let's also look at this. If you're following Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's logic, she basically leaves herself with only two options. She can A, either completely dis dismiss Trump and say, you know what, that was just locker room talk and we shouldn't have cared about that. Or, because she defended this woman, she has to say they were both wrong. But the way that she does it there is she creates an inconsistency within herself in that same tweet. And so what's funny about that is I don't think she's quite bright enough to even realize that that's exactly what she did. Though granted, not saying that it's okay, just making an observation here. Right now with our political atmosphere, consistency has really been neither side's strong point, and her tweet kind of points that out. Let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Daniel. And for those of you who have not been following along, we've been going through our series on Daniel. And he's already gotten in good favor with the king. Uh, we've seen that he and his friends have been allowed to just eat the vegetables, just drink the water. And so now Daniel and his friends are sort of established in the king's court. And then we kind of shift over in the second chapter to an episode that is going on with the king of Babylon. Now, at this point, Daniel and his friends are not really in the king's presence. They're not really old enough to practice. They're not really old enough to be around the king, that he has other magicians and wise men surrounding him that handle this kind of thing. And so... In the second chapter, we're introduced to King Nebuchadnezzar, and the king has this dream, and he sends for his magicians. And he talks to the Chaldeans and his magicians and other soothsayers and that kind of thing, and he says, I want you to interpret my dream. And they keep saying, oh, we'll, we'll interpret your dream. Go ahead. Tell us what the dream was about. And he says, no, I want you to tell me what the dream was, and then I'll know that whatever interpretation that you give me is valid. In other words, you knowing what my dream was is sort of the test. And if I know that you got the dream correctly, you know what I was dreaming, then I'll also know that your interpretation of it, your understanding of it, is correct. And the, uh, the Chaldeans don't much like this. And the king actually declares that whoever says, oh, I know what it was, uh, and then they come up with something fake, you are to be executed. And so this is a very risky proposition that he wants to know what this dream is. And if you come up to him and you lie to him and give him a false answer, then you're going to be executed and taken away. So this is the response that we see from the Chaldeans, the magicians there. This takes place in Daniel chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. The Chaldeans answered to the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare this matter for the king, insomuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. So really what this all boils down to is the Chaldeans, the magicians there, can't tell him what the dream is, is because they're fakes. They're not real magicians. They're people that do sleight of hand and they are probably very well educated and can tell people things about nature. But as far as actual having supernatural powers, it seems based on this that they're fakes. They can't see into people's dreams. They can't read into people's hearts. They can do a card trick for you maybe if cards existed back then, but they can't actually do anything supernatural or something that, that has something to do with that realm. And so because they're fakes, they can't really do what the king is asking them to do. And they're saying, well, kings don't ask us to do that, which is no king has ever asked us to do that. And that's why we don't do it. And the king is like, you're supposed to be my wise men. You're supposed to be the magicians and people that deal with the supernatural. And yet you can't even tell me what my dream is. See, this is the thing. The king 
reasonable as he may be or not, is catching on to the fact that these guys aren't really who they say they are. And then we get this really interesting dialogue from the Chaldeans where they sort of accidentally proclaim the truth. And I love the way that the Bible structures this. They accidentally, not knowing it, tell him what the problem is, which is they say, if you'll look back in verse 10, that there is not a man on earth that can do this. Well, they're right. There's not a man on earth that can do this. There is no human being that can tell another human being what their dream was that they dreamed and be able to interpret it to them. The only way anybody could do that is if God did so. That if God informed somebody of the person's dream. And you'll remember that we were looking back at our, our previous episode in episode one, or sorry, in chapter one, that Daniel has the ability to interpret dreams. Which means what? That he's getting that gift from somewhere that is not on this earth. A man on this earth cannot interpret a person's dream. But God can. And so because Daniel has God to inform him, to tell him how to do this, it's God doing the interpreting. It's God that knows what Nebuchadnezzar's dream is because he knows all things. It's not Daniel. And Daniel knows that. Daniel knows that his gift is not his. It's not something that comes from him. And so these magicians sort of accidentally, even though they're fakes and don't really know what's going on, they sort of accidentally proclaim the truth which is that there is not a man on earth that can do the thing that the king is asking of them. And he also says here uh, in verse 11, this could, only be, this could not be done by any man except the gods whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Now they're talking about pagan gods there, of course. But the point is, they're saying that the only person that could do this is a god that does not have mortal flesh. See, that's really significant because, again, this is pointing to the real God. This is pointing to the God that is going to interpret the stream for Nebuchadnezzar. And they unknowingly explain to the king exactly what is going to happen. They kind of set the table for what is about to happen with Daniel and with God. And God does this a few times in Scripture. For example, at the trial of Jesus... Um, you see that, or sorry, not at the trial of Jesus, before the trial of Jesus, you see all the, the big wigs, the elders and the Pharisees coming together. And one of the things that the high priest there says is that it's better for one man to die than for a nation to perish. And now he was talking about, he was afraid that Jesus was going to bring Israel down. And because of that, he said, well, what we need to do is we need for him to die so that the rest of the nation can be spared. He didn't realize he was actually proclaiming prophecy by saying that by one man's death, the entire earth will be saved. And so he, this happens a few times in Scripture. There's also at the crucifixion, the Roman soldier asserting well, this really was the Son of God. You also have pagan priests in the Old Testament that kind of uh, unintentionally testify to God being the real God. And this is just one more instance of that where these pagan magicians, it turns out they sort of accidentally tell the truth when it comes to God and his power and who actually has the ability to do the things that the king is asking for. And so God sort of in his own way primes the king to know who he is through Daniel. And there are times where God does this not just in Bible times, but in our own times, I believe. There are certain people that are just super receptive to the gospel. And I think that part of the reason that that is the case is because something has already transpired in their life where God is there and he is setting the table. He knows this person wants to accept the gospel, that their heart is going to be good soil for the gospel to grow. And because of that, he sets them up in such a way that they're already primed by the time the minister or evangelist or whoever it is, the saint comes by and teaches them about the gospel Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is a perfect example. Here you have a eunuch writing by himself that just happens to be reading a scroll of Isaiah and happens to be reading a part that's talking about the prophecy of Jesus. And along comes Philip and is like, okay, well, that was easy. <laughs> God's already done the legwork. He's already laid the groundwork for evangelism to take place. And so I think that's another thing that we have to be aware of is Daniel basically waltzes in and the king already kind of has the right idea about what's going to happen 
if someone can interpret his dream. Because if he's listening to his magicians, it means that whoever interprets his dream will not be a man on this earth, and it will not be somebody with flesh, but a god. Somebody that does not dwell in mortal flesh. And so God has kind of primed the pump here, primed it, and gotten him ready to accept this truth. And this is something that we need to be aware of in our own lives when we evangelize to other people. It's not always going to be easy. Most people are probably going to turn us down. But the truth is that if it's somebody that God knows is going to be receptive, actually, even if he doesn't know, God is laying the groundwork. God is already laying the groundwork for that to happen because he's already seeking that lost soul. And sometimes all that needs to happen is for somebody like Daniel to come along and proclaim God's truth because God has already set the soil to be receptive. That is a really inspiring thing to think about because when we declare God's truth, sometimes God has already done the groundwork for us. All we have to do is follow his command and spread the seed. Stay the course, friends.